Yes, we are. So I'll let Jeff introduce us, but um, we're also glad that you're here today. We're with Tiger Graph. I'm Kaylee. I'm the Cloud Community Marketing Manager, and I will let Jeff take it from here. Yeah, hi. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jeff Tizer. I am a graduate of the program. I graduated about, gosh, uh, 10, 11 years ago uh, from the master's program. And um, I am working at Tiger Graph now, and when I, when I took the uh, a course that I think eventually became the Entity Resolution course, uh, it was sort of a special offering uh, back then, but it struck me, and then as I continue to do my graduate work, it struck me how graph-like uh, Entity Resolution can be. So I, when I started working at Tiger Graph, I reached out to Dr. Talbert to uh, say, hey, you know, I'd, I'd really like to see if I can share some information with your, with your students, with the program. I, I, I'd also like to you know, benefit from any research that you're working on. And I, I you know, it, it, it came as no surprise to John. He had the same thoughts that, yeah, this is, this is inherently graph shaped and uh, that there could be some fruitful collaboration. So in that vein, we started, um, we, well, we wanted to offer a series of, uh, of uh, presentations. This is the first of them. And I'm gonna be presenting to you uh, a bit about our product, which is a, we're a graph database, Tiger Graph, and we'll get into the specifics of that. And then I'll show you some uh, uh, graph uh, use cases, uh, some algorithms around page rank and uh, community detection. So we're going to do a kind of a whirlwind tour of the product of graph databases in general. It's going to be a lot of sort of fundamental information. And please feel free to ask questions, um, preferably in the chat. Uh, and then I will uh, get to them as I can. But I'm really excited to be here. And I'm, I'm so glad uh, you're here to join us. So thank you for that. John? Yeah, thank you so much, Jeff. I don't want to take uh, any of your time other than just to, again, thank you and Tiger Graph for this uh, collaboration. I, I really think it'll be very fruitful. I know we have, uh, I know I have several research projects going on right now that uh, would involve uh, uh, graph technologies and graph databases. And so we really appreciate you taking the time to present and then to offer this uh, time uh, to use Tiger Graph technology on the on your cloud platform. So again, thanks very much. And we're looking forward to it. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Can everybody see my slide? Should say yeah. zero to advanced analytics. And six okay, great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn off uh, video just because it could be a little distracting. And I'm going to be Look around at different things. So I, I hope that's okay. And we'll say bandwidth also, because uh, you never know with Zoom, right? Okay. So as I said, I'm Jeff Tizer. I'm a solution engineer at Tiger Graph, which means I'm sort of the technical half of the sales team, but I tend to skew a little bit more technical than sales. Uh, but that's the great thing about this kind of position is that it's a it's a continuum and and uh, you know it's a it's a big tent and uh, uh, a lot of room for a lot of different sort of uh, perspectives. And what we're doing today is I'm gonna be guiding you through a presentation accompanied by a hands-on exercise. Now, if you haven't had time to uh, make, uh, create a, a free Tiger Graph account, you know, that's okay. This, this presentation is, is oriented to be a little bit more salesy, but I'm really here not to sell you anything other than just sell you on how exciting, you know, graph technology can be and, and how, how great an application uh, it can have to entity resolution. But I would encourage you to, you know, at least avail yourself of, uh, you know, of our free tier so you can, uh, you know, have a look at what the product looks like, what a graph database can do, uh, have a look at our, our, our algorithms. We have about, um, I think, eight categories of algorithms that cover various aspects of, of graph analysis. Um, so to do that, though, you need to create a free account, and I will walk you through that shortly. So, excuse me, the exercise that we're going to be doing today is is based on a financial fraud use case. And we're gonna be executing it on, uh, again, a free instance of, of Tiger Graph in, uh, in Tiger Graph Cloud, that's our, our managed service. And you can run it um, on, you can run your Tiger Graph instances in Amazon, Azure, or uh, G GCP. Uh, so we're cloud neutral, as we like to say. And you'll also be using our Python package for interacting with Tiger Graph. It's called PyTigerGraph. And, uh, Finally, we'll be doing all of this within a Google Colab notebook. So if all that is a bunch of gibberish, uh, no problem. We'll, uh, we'll cover it and you'll see uh, what I'm talking about and see really how easy it is. So first though, before we get into the, uh, uh, the hands-on portion, I'm gonna, um, we have a short presentation. 
uh, just so we can introduce some of the fundamentals. So today's, uh, excuse me, today's session is packed with content, but the agenda outlining it really is. not We're gonna uh, set the table with the what, why, when, and how of graphs and graph databases and graph analytics. And with those cognitive utensils in place, if you will, we're gonna showcase them by creating a tiger graph instance, loading it with data, and applying some graph analytics to it. Okay, so pretty straightforward. Uh, okay, so I just wanted to see if there's anything in the chat so far. Uh, good to go. And sorry, I went the wrong way. There we go. Okay, so first, what are graph databases? Well, graph is, you know, looking at it from sort of a metacognitive perspective, you know, graph is, is how we think. We, we, not to get too philosophical here, but yeah, we form concepts in our mind and we link them based on knowledge, experience, and other ways of knowing in order to drive decision making. So, and that's, you know, the, the fundamental uh, uh, objects of graph are, are, you might, some of you might even be familiar with the sort of the formula for graph, which is just G, uh, left bracket VE. So a graph is nothing more than vertices and edges. And with, uh, with the property graph, which is what tiger graph is, and I'll explain what that is in just a second, there's also the additional element of the property. So I'm gonna contrast um, graph databases with some other, and there is a lot of content behind this slide, so please bear with me. So what this slide does is it contrasts graph databases with relational databases and key value stores, which are representative of other NoSQL databases. Now on the left, you know, most of us are familiar with relational databases as they've been the backbone of data management for the last four decades. But among their problems is they can be designed for OLAP, you know, online analytical processing workloads or OLTP, online transaction processing workloads, but not for a mix of both usually have to choose at design time. And that's why there are techniques for designing transactional databases. Uh, fundamentally, data normalization is one of them, making sure there's only one fact in one place. And then there are uh, designs that are optimized for uh, analytical workloads, such as uh, data marts and data warehouses, uh, which usually employ um, dimensional modeling, you know, which, is, which is designed for read intensive interactions with the database. So really you have to kind of choose which uh, usage profile is going to, you know, re best reflect uh, well what you're going to use the database for and design accordingly. So you have to choose a design time, and we have a mix for this uh, uh, this transaction. Well, we have a we have a name for this mix of transaction and uh, analytical workloads. It's called HTAP, and it's not a, a phrase that's unique to Tiger Graph. And HTAP stands for Hybrid Transactional and Analytical Processing. And you know, our platform enables it by uh, allowing concurrent read and write transactions with ACID properties. So ACID is, a, as you may know from your database course and just from your experience and all being smart folks that ACID stands for atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable. And it, it really um, speaks to what, trans what properties transactions should have in a multi-user you know, concurrent database environment. So let me pause for a second and just say, you know, if you're hearing a lot of terms uh, today that, you know, you've heard in your courses, I, I, I think that's good news. That means that, yeah, boy, this stuff actually comes up and we really do need to know this. And I remember, I know you're all graduate students, but I remember my undergraduate courses, there was a lot of stuff that we learned. I was like, are we ever going to use this? But the answer is, is usually yes. You, you may not apply it every day, but you'll certainly hear these uh, terms and, uh, you know, with your customers. So um, yeah, this stuff really does matter. So. So keep paying attention in your courses. Um, so yeah, a hybrid transactional analytical processing. So I'm gonna pepper this talk with a lot of, uh, you know, these exciting anecdotes as we go through. So I hope they're not too distracting. Um, so in the middle uh, are key value stores and they're very flexible, but don't always scale well and sometimes can't adequately represent complex domains. You know, they have a highly fluid schema, but they can't necessarily capture the rich semantics that, uh, uh, characterize some, <clears throat> excuse me, some uh, domains or, or universes of discourse, as they say. Now, on the right, we have graph databases. Okay, now I do want to point out that not all graph databases on the market are native graph databases. Some are, in fact, uh, implemented in key value stores or other NoSQL databases under the covers. So, for instance, I think uh, 
Microsoft Cos Microsoft's Cosmos DB is, is, is that way. And there are a couple of others. And, and this matters because of performance and scalability. Um, ideally, you'd, you'd have a native graph database, which is superior for graph analytics by virtue of their design. So I mentioned earlier sort of the, the fundamental you know, atoms of, of graph, if you will, and that's really vertices and edges. So vertices are the circles and edges are the relationships that connect them. Now in graph relationships are a are first class uh, a data type. You know, they, they are actually persisted uh, when they, and on disk graph, excuse me, on disk uh, vertices and the nodes that, uh, excuse me, vertices and the edges that connect them are, are persisted on disk. And are again, the, the edges are first class data types. Unlike in relational where the relationships are really, I mean, yes, you can have declarative referential integrity, but it's really up to you to do the navigation for you to do the joining and the joining happens at, at runtime, uh, unless you're using something like a materialized view or, or some other um, objects for, uh, uh, for getting around some of the performance limitations of joins. But in general, uh, relationships uh, you know, don't, aren't really uh, represented as things in a relational database in the same way they are uh, in graph databases. And, I'm gonna go ahead and, yeah, we're, you know, I'm 30 quarter after. So I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, yeah, we'll move on to the next slide here. And I wanna distinguish, uh, or I wanna describe a little bit more about, there are two kinds of graphs, okay? There are, uh, if you, if you, you know, do some search and, searches on Google, you might come across different graph types. One of those might be what are called RDF graphs. And these represent uh, facts as, as what are called triples. So there's a subject, a predicate, and an object. And that's kind of analogous to what you're seeing here. A subject might be order, the object might be payment, and the predicate would be accepted. So order, accepted, payment, okay? That's not us, but I do wanna at least contrast that because you may see you know, uh, RDF uh, in your travels. We are what's called a property graph. A property graph, and, and furthermore, we're a typed property graph, meaning that there's a defined schema for the vertices and edges. So what you see on the left here, you know, customer supplier payment, et cetera, those are types, which is actually very similar to what you see in a relational database where you've got entity types uh, and they've got, uh, uh, you know, they've got attributes that are uh, strongly typed themselves. So what makes Tiger Graph a property graph though, is that the vertices and edges can have properties such as here, you can see that payment has two properties or attributes, ID and amount. And also the relationship or the edge has properties as well, such as date, okay? So that is what a property graph is. It's vertices and edges, and then each of them can be characterized by properties. All right, so when to use graph databases and why? Well, there are a lot of great reasons. You know, graph databases embrace complexity. They allow you to model a problem domain with high fidelity. Okay, between the model and uh, the real world. And you can, you know, you can do this with really just a, a handful of fundamental key constructs, which I mentioned earlier, that is to say vertices, edges, and properties. And for another, you know, as I, as I also mentioned, um, joins uh, have always been the Achilles heel for relational databases. Now, I, I wanna make sure that I, 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 this is not a knock against relational databases. You know, what, what we're really talking about here is this is the age of, you know, what they call polyglot persistence. You know, there's, the idea here is to simply choose the right tool for the, for the right job. And there are certain class of use cases uh, that graph databases are the better choice than relational. So what I'm trying to do is compare and contrast against relational. Mostly it's because, Everybody knows about relational, but this is in no way meant to disparage relational or say that, you know, we are the new one size fits all tool. That's not the case. It's simply to compare and contrast this um, data management scheme with, with others. Um, so I, 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 I want to make sure I, I clarify that. Um, you know, I started my career and continue to use relational technology and it's wonderful. Uh, Let's see here, anything else I wanna say? So we talked about, oh yeah. So we talked about though joins are and always have been the Achilles heel for relational databases. You know, you, you gain some flexi flexibility in combining normalized, highly granular data, but that can come at the expense of career performance and complexity. Uh, you know, you have to do the navigation. Um, but in a da graph database, navigation is intuitive and thus simple because once you find your starting vertex, you can just follow the, follow the connections. 
So I mentioned MPP later in the presentation, so I want to introduce it now. MPP stands for Massively Parallel Processing, okay, and it describes a systems architecture of interconnected computers. Each of those computers has their own processors, memory, and storage, and, they're, and they all execute a workload in parallel. You might also hear MPP referred to as shared nothing, because unlike another kind of processing model that is symmetric multiprocessing, in MPP, all these resources, CPU, disk, and uh, memory are not shared among uh, um, the servers, but rather they each have their own. So it's called shared nothing. Now in Tiger Graph, the graph is partitioned among the nodes in the cluster and queries execute in parallel across all of the nodes that have uh, data that the query needs. So it's not necessarily the case that all nodes or all the data on the nodes will be read by a given query. It, it depends on if that node has data that the query needs in order to fulfill, uh, uh, to fulfill itself. And we're also gonna be looking at some code. So we, our language is called GSQL, GraphSQL. And as you can infer from the name, it's very SQL-like. So I wanted to at least, we're gonna look at a bit of code and I wanna at least introduce you to sort of the fundamental operators. And a lot of them should look very familiar because there's they're from SQL. But there is a, one big difference here is we, instead of group by, we have what are called accumulators. And accumulators are really sort of the secret sauce of, of GSQL. I also wanna point out that as of, as of now, there is no standard property graph query language like there is for SQL in the relational world and Sparkle, which is the query language for those RDF uh, databases I mentioned earlier. But ISO, the International, standard, International Organization for Standardization, uh, has um, pulled together a working group to define a standard um, property graph query language and Tiger Graph uh, is on that uh, committee. So we're helping to define the, uh, this next standard. But for now, each, each property graph database has their own query language. And again, ours is called GSQL. And there are two things here I wanna point out really quick that instead of group by, we have what are called accumulators. And accumulators are, are really just data structures. There are a lot of different types. For instance, there are some accumulators that do summing. There are map accumulators that do a key value pair mapping. So they're basically data structures, okay? And they're data structures that, that exist on every vertex or edge. And I wanna just describe really quick what an accumulator is using kind of a, a silly example. But what, again, what accumulators do is they are data structures that exist on all the vertices and edges. And they, and they enable the collection and passing of data among uh, the vertices uh, via the edges. So if we're, if we're looking at a scenario where there is a teacher who is administering an exam, the teacher would be the accumulator. The students are the vertices and edges. The test paper is the message. And what happens is that the, each, of the, each of the students is a vertex and they pass their test to the teacher, and that is the accumulation phase. The teacher accumulates all the papers. And then, you know, as, as she's trying to compute the average, of course, she needs to get all of the papers in first before she can, can uh, compute the average. And that's done in what's called the post accum phase. So that's after everything has been accumulated. So the accumulation phase is where the students pass or where the vertices pass all their information. And then at the post accum stage of the query, is where all of that uh, data that was passed is, is computed or is, is, is tallied finally. So in our case, it would be the average, okay? Don't worry if you don't remember any of this. I simply wanted to introduce uh, MPP and a little bit about our query because I mentioned them later on and it occurred to me that I might wanna give you a you know, bit of a uh, background on them, okay? Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna go through this uh, a little fast, but these are, are certain classes of graph algorithms. So there are specific kinds of graph algorithms on each uh, for each of these groupings here. And I'm gonna cover a couple, of one in, a couple ones in particular. So deep link analysis is 
the ability to explore deep into your data in real time and discover and analyze connections many hops deep. So I mentioned that once you started a vertex, oops, sorry about that. Once you started a vertex, it's easy to traverse the graph from there because you simply follow the pointers. And the way Tiger Graph works is that all starting vertices and their edges are co-located on disk. So you get that locality of access that's so important in performance. You know, you don't want those read write heads moving all over the place and you know, having to pass uh, data back and forth among the nodes. Ideally, there'd be as little uh, inter-node traffic as possible and you know, as little uh, disk movement as possible. Now, we are also in the case, of course, of solid state memory. So, so those, that electromechanical movement is not as important or is not as impactful as it used to be, but all the same locality of access still has advantages. The second one is um, multi-dimensional entity and pattern matching. And we use this for uh, recommendation engines where you can say, okay, it seems that, so if you look at, let's say that the graph in number two here represents people uh, or members, let's say they're, they're members of a, uh, a health, uh, health insurer and they each have their own subgraphs, you know, their, their, their own uh, member vertex and all the things that may characterize them, like the medical encounters they've had, the prescriptions they've been given, uh, the doctors they've seen, you, know, you get the idea. So, and these are each gonna be subgraphs or, you know, connected components. Um, and it might be the case, you know, getting back to recommendations engines that you can see here that, you know, you've got two, uh, two people, again, if these each represent a person, you've got two, they share the same two orange vertices and the same blue vertices. So you can say that, okay, well, I'm gonna recommend, these, these guys are similar by virtue of the, that they have the same kinds of vertices in their subgraphs. You know, they, they've got the same prescriptions, they see the same kind of specialist, you know, whatever the similarity might measure. But I can see that this, you know, this customer uh, has this um, other, uh, sees this other specialist or is on this other medication that this one isn't. So why don't I um, recommend or, you know, consider prescribing um, or consider recommending they see this specialist? Again, whatever the, whatever the commonality happens to be. This is much easier in, say, a movie example where you can say that, yeah, these three, I should have probably chosen that to begin with. But you can say that, you know, these, these, these two people both like these three movies. This one watched this movie, this other one didn't. So let me recommend this movie to this person. But the idea here is that similarity is based on the structure and makeup of their subgraphs and not just strictly say string similarity, okay? The third item here is where you can find if two uh, vertices meet in the middle anywhere. And we can use this for a couple of ways. You can find in their in a medical uh, scenario, you can find maybe a prescribing doctors that are sort of central to your uh, community, you know, or, or in another case, we, we have customers that use our database for anti-money laundering or for fraud scenarios. And the idea here is that there'd be a list of, uh, you know, say you're a bank and you're given a list from various, uh, there's several lists like this, but there's various government agencies that publish lists of, of people you're not supposed to do business with, like the Office of Foreign Asset Control. So you've got a list of people and all their characteristics, all the aliases they use, last known addresses, whatever the case may be. And you want to make sure that the person that's sitting in front of you that's trying to open up a brokerage account isn't in any way connected to this uh, bad actor. So you can start with at two ends of the uh, graph, if you will, and see if they meet anywhere in the middle and, and, and you know, describe a large social network, you know, connecting these two. And then last thing I'll touch on here is community detection, or excuse me, hub and community detection. So the idea here is, uh, you know, finding communities of densely connected vertices Okay, and there are a couple of algorithms that are used for that, and we'll talk about one or two of them today. And hub detection is uh, essentially trying to find those influencers or those important uh, vertices within a given um, community or a given subgraph. Google's PageRank is an is an example of this. We're gonna we're gonna look at PageRank quite a bit shortly, uh, but it you know it what it does is it it uses the uh, number of incoming and outgoing uh, links to establish a, uh, well, in this case, a web page's importance vis-a-vis uh, -vis all of its peers. Um, and that's essentially what hub detection is, is finding the most influential nodes, excuse me, vertices. So I keep saying nodes and vertices interchangeably, which is kind of a bad habit of mine. And uh, in 
because we're we're a massively parallel database, I try to use Node to talk about the you know computers in a cluster. But you might hear uh, vertices and nodes uh, used interchangeably. Um, and edges and arcs might be another way you you might hear the the, the relationships referred. Again, we're uh, we we use the terms uh, vertices and edges, but sometimes I slip up. I'm going to skip this slide, but but it really what it really does is introduce uh, or illustrate that uh, that seven this this deep link an analysis here. But in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and skip it. But really, what it really does is just describes a way that your credit query progresses. Uh, using the um, example data set that we're going to work with today, which illustrates a, um, a Venmo-like application, so a, a payment uh, application. Um, so I'm just going to skip this over, but what it really does is describe a shortest path traversal through the graph. Um, and we'll get to the good stuff here. So sorry about that. So graph algorithms, um, you know, at least in our typology, graph algorithms can be classified into five groups depending on what they find or measure. And these groups are path, centrality, similarity, community, and classification. So in, our, in this workshop, we're gonna look at representative algorithms in the centrality, uh, similarity, and community groups. We're gonna start with one of the most well-known graph algorithms, which is PageRank, which I've already introduced. <laughs> You know, PageRank, again, is a centrality detection algorithm, and it's used to measure influence in the form of relative importance. So the objects of measurement can be web pages, as in the case of Google, people, or scientific research. In fact, PageRank was made famous by Google's founders, but it traces its roots going back to, or it traces its roots back to the 1950s, to the work of an information scientist named Eugene Garfield, who, who employed it for citation analysis. So PageRank has two fundamental operating principles, and these are illustrated in the lower left, okay? A page's authority increases if more, pa more pages point to it. And, you, and for, for uh, our purposes, you can just substitute page for, for vertex. And the second principle is that a page is more authoritative if the pages that point to it in turn are more authoritative. So yes, as you can infer, this is a recursive um, relationship. Looking at the graph on the right, we can see that Ivy down here in the lower uh, left has the highest page rank score, which in this context means she has the most friends. And we'll talk a bit about why her, you know, what it is about these relationships that indicate a higher score. And we're only showing a snapshot here. Um, you don't, you aren't necessarily seeing all the relationships that these guys might have, but again, it's a function of, I, I, Ivy's high score is a function of both um, what's coming, the, the weight of the people coming into her and, and, and uh, emanating from her vertex, but also all of uh, the edges emanating and are coming in and going out of these vertices as well. So I want to point out that all of our algorithms, including our implementations of PageRank, are all open source and can be found here. Let me, nope, okay, let me, uh, interesting. Sorry, let me, uh, all right. So we have, so, um, and I'll share this later, uh, but all of our uh, graph algorithms are implemented in GSQL are, and are freely available on GitHub. And you can see here that we've got them grouped into those six categories that I mentioned earlier, or actually there are five here with one sort of general catch-all for uh, machine learning and graph embeddings. Uh, so here's an example. If, if I go to centrality, I see page rank, and, but there are others as you as you can see, uh, like between the centrality and harmonic centrality. And uh, there are a couple of different flavors of page rank. Okay, and I encourage you to look at all of these uh, implementations. Um, but getting back to the presentation, um, let's go to the next slide here. So I'm going to skip this slide, but what it really does is showcase um, page rank in the context of financial fraud, which is, again, the use case that we're going to be um, going over in a second here. Um, and it, it just shows how, you know, you can find bad actors uh, because usually bad actors are connected to other bad actors. 
and you can sort of invert the normal. Normally, you would look at, you know, a high page rank depends on or denotes trustworthiness or authoritativeness, but this kind of relationship can be inverted in the context of a financial fraud use case where it's not really so much about authoritativeness, it's about, you know, bad guys connected to other bad guys. But page rank, all this, you know, uh, works the same either way. There's another uh, algorithm that we're going to talk about, uh, which I think you guys have all either seen or are probably going to see uh, in the entity resolution course. This is a very venerable algorithm used for string similarity, but it doesn't have to be for strings. It can really be for a set of anything. They can be tokens, they can be characters, or they can be nodes in a graph. So Jacquard similarity is simply the, uh, uh, it, it measures set similarity. And it's simply the uh, measure of, it's, it's the intersection of the two sets over the union. Okay, and you can see here that we, we've got this uh, an illustration here on this slide in, as a market basket analysis illustration. You know, how similar are these two shopping baskets? Um, basket one has you know these items, and basket two has these items. And, and uh, I'm not going to read them to you, but you can see here that uh, basket one and two have bread and bananas in common, and they have all these other ones uh, that are unique to them. So their jacquard similarity would be two sevenths. Basket one and three, they've only got one thing in common, so they have a lower score. So Jacquard is a similarity measurement algorithm. It works on sets and it measures how similar sets are. And uh, we use we use Jacquard similarity uh, as part of a recommendation engine, just like what I showed earlier. You can you could uh, going back to this slide here, you can measure the similarity of these two based on the number of uh, vertices they have in common. Okay, so that is Jacquard. So we're going to talk about page rank and Jacquard. And there's one more thing we're going to talk, one more algorithm we're talking about, which is called label propagation. And this is a um, community detection algorithm. Okay, and I'm simplifying it a bit, but the algorithm works like this. So first, each vertex is labeled with a unique community ID. So at first, each vertex is a community of one, okay, or a set of one. Then you're gonna repeat the following steps for each vertex until there are no more label updates or you've reached the maximum number of iterations that you've set uh, for, the, for the query or for the algorithm. So the first step is you count the community IDs of your neighbors. And then you'll update your own community ID to be the one most common among your neighbors. And in the case of a tie, you can select one at random. So what that happens here is at the end of the process, vertices with the same label belong to the same community. And you can see on this slide, there are two large communities and perhaps two or three smaller ones. And there are lots of different ways to do this. Community detection is a very vibrant uh, topic of research. Um, you know, your own uh, professor, um, uh, I'm sorry, gosh, I feel terrible that the name escapes me, but he teaches the database course and he is the one of the authors of dbscan which is a, uh, also a cluster of community detection algorithm, if I recall. Dr. Shu. Thank you, Dr. Shu. I should have remembered that. I loved that class. The database class was wonderful. And as I said, all the stuff you're gonna be learning there or have learned will really apply. So, all right. So let's um, take a moment here and go to our environment now, <laughs> excuse me, and do the cloud setup. And so what we're going to do is you're going to navigate if you want, or you can just you know watch me in the interest of time. I'm going to navigate to our to tgcloud.io, okay. And what's going to happen is you're going to I'll start over. I'll go to tgcloud.io. And it's going to ask you to register or log in. And so registering should just take a second. And we're all you do is just give it an email address and a password, okay. So I'm gonna log in and it's gonna bring me to my dashboard of all the solutions I have or all the instances of Tiger Graph I have. Of course, you, you won't have so many, but you know I, I work for the company and so I have several spun up um, uh, and you'll go over to, excuse me, my solutions. And what you're gonna do is you're going to click create solution. Now, what you're presented with here is the opportunity to either create a blank instance of Tiger Graph of, uh, within which you can create your own schema, load it with data, 
write your own queries and do your own interactive analyses. Okay, so you can you can try it in perpetuity. You get 50 gig of storage and about seven and a half gigs of memory. And then we encourage you to do that and to you know uh, apply some of the algorithms in our GitHub account um, and have a look. Or you can choose from one of these eight categories of starter kits that that represent that have different instances of Tiger Graph. In some cases, some of these only have one, but others have a few that um, represent a given use case or a given problem domain. So in our case, we have anti-fraud, and you're going to be picking for if you if you want to if you want to do this exercise, you're going to pick uh, fraud and anti-money laundering. But I also want to show you a couple of others. We use a, uh, a set of data uh, for uh, that for um, airport data to illustrate centrality algorithms and community detection algorithms and shortest path algorithms. So if you want to get familiar with some of these fundamental algorithm classes, you can spin up this environment. Again, these, these environments are pre-populated. They already have a schema. They've already got data. And all you have to do is load the data and apply the uh, queries that are also part of these uh, starter kit packages. So. Uh, you don't have to start from scratch. And let's see, under machine learning, we have one that might be perhaps interesting to everyone here, in database machine learning for entity resolution. Now, I think, uh, you know, given that I'm biased toward entity resolution and uh, that I think we can do better on this, and um, but you'll see, you know, kind of a graph approach to entity resolution, uh, but there are, there's more that we could do here. And, I've always been eager to take the uh, entity resolution challenge data uh, and actually, uh, you know, uh, put it into a Tiger Graph instance and apply some of the graph specific uh, uh, similarity metrics uh, and, and, and entity resolution metrics, uh, or, or excuse me, algorithms uh, to that data set. So getting back to us, anti fraud, you're going to pick this one and click next. And right now, our free uh, image or a free instance. Or instance is limited to, to AWS, but it'll be also be provided shortly on Azure and Google Cloud. Just pick the default, or if you want to, if you happen to be in uh, Arkansas, you might want to choose um, something closer to you. But but latency really isn't a factor with this small data set, so it shouldn't really matter. And you click next again, and then here you're going to name your solution, you're going to set your password, and you're going to create a subdomain. So. The subdomains that I created for my instance. So I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to go ahead and create. Um, so let me give me one second here. Um, actually, so I'm just do, going to do JKT. Uh, this actually won't work because you can only have one free instance at a time, and I already have some. But but you need to create a, a subdomain that's unique. So I'll just put a JKT uh, thin fraud, um, you know, dash UALR or something like that. Okay, and then you click next. Oops, sorry, I need to set my password here. So I'm gonna set something creative like Tiger Graph. And then you're saying, oh, you, the, you're, this, this is a summary. And then you just click uh, submit. And in about five minutes, uh, your instance will be provisioned. And we'll go back here and I'll show you. I've got just, I'm sort of cheating here. I've got, I've got one that's gonna look like yours. It's gonna be empty. And another one that's uh, already been populated so I can toggle back and forth in the interest of time. Um, but let me show you what we're gonna be um, looking at today. Um, yeah, let me actually, so while your instance is provisioning, again, it'll, it'll, it'll say, um, I can't remember what the word is, but it'll, it'll indicate that it's, it's starting up, that it's creating your environment. Let me go back to the deck and I'm just show you, tell you about our, our, our workshop use case context. So this is our schema. I mentioned before that it's a. Uh, Venmo-like application. So what you have is uh, users that are uh, that interact with uh, on a transaction. Uh, you've got accounts for the user. Okay, they've got uh, an <clears throat> excuse me. You just have one to many accounts. They've got a device on which they uh, conduct their transactions or um, execute the transactions, and they have a payment instrument that's usually connected to the device. So a very simple schema. It's just devices, payment instruments, users, accounts, and transactions. Okay, so by by uh, uh, by design, very simple. And then finally, you've got this recursive relationship here where users can refer each other. Okay, so that is essentially it. All right, so your instances may not be uh, necessarily ready right now, but um, 
again, you don't have to fall. You can just, you know, watch me and do this, you know, asynchronously um, if you want. I'm, I'll be covering everything you would be doing on your own. Um, so no problem there if, uh, if you don't want to provision your own instance. I just wanted at least to cover how you would do it and what you'd be seeing when you do it. Okay. All right. So here's the hands-on session. So here's a, some approaches or using some of those algorithms before to detect financial fraud. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. During this session, we're gonna view and modify the graph schema. We're gonna map and load data. We're gonna generate a security token. We're gonna run some basic queries. We're gonna enrich our data set and we're gonna run our graph algorithms. And I'm gonna run through the first five pretty quickly. <laughs> Usually this is a, a uh, or this can be up to a 90 minute presentation with questions, but um, we don't quite have that much time. I wanna save at least five minutes um, for Q and A. So I apologize for the brisk pace, um, but again, you can do this on your own and I will share all the materials with you and I'm happy to answer any of your questions um, via email. Okay, so from here, we're gonna to toggle back over to our environment. And I'm going to show you, so I'm going to go to this instance, okay, and I'm going to show you what uh, you're going to go, what uh, steps you would take. Okay, so you click applications and go to Graph Studio. Graph Studio is our IDE, our integrated development environment. Okay, this is not the only way to interact with, with Tiger Graph. We also have a, a rich, uh, you know, again, GSQL, and it has DDL as well as query capabilities or DML. So um, you can do a lot of this stuff with the command line. Uh, but Graph Studio is a great way to get started. And what you can see on the left is a logical progression uh, from designing your schema to exploring it interactively and writing queries. So I'm going to go down to, I'm going to look at a particular subgraph called anti fraud. Okay, and I'm going to go to design schema. And you're going to see what you saw earlier on that other slide. And you're going to, what you'd be doing here is what, 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 we're showing in the exercise is what you're going to be doing here is you're going to be modifying the schema. You're going to be adding an additional vertex and a couple of edges. But again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through that right now. But what you'll be doing is you'll be adding an account vertex. And you're also going to add, like I said, three edges. One for linking users to um, transactions. Another one for linking users to accounts, which again is, is, is a vertex that we'd be creating in step one. And finally, there you'd be creating another recursive edge, which is user similar to, and we're gonna populate that edge later, indicating similarity among users. So I'm gonna go over to my fully populated instance here and show you what that looks like. So when you're done with your schema, it's going to look like this. As I said, you, you're gonna be adding account. You're gonna be adding two edges, user to account and account to transaction. And you'll be adding a user similar to. And then finally, you're gonna also add a page rank attribute, okay? So those are just the, those, those, those changes need to be done before you execute the code that I'll be showing you in a moment, okay? Once you do that, we can do some interactive analyses. Oh, let me show you one more thing. Okay. The next step in this process would be to map data to the graph. So this is one way to populate the graph. We're not an ETL tool, but we have a, you know, a mechanism to bring data in and you, uh, to rather to populate the data, uh, populate the graph, excuse me. You can bring data in through CSV or through S3 buckets. And that's through Graph Studio. There are also additional mechanisms for bringing data in that you can't do in Graph Studio right now. You can bring data in through Kafka, uh, JSON-based data. Uh, you can bring data in through uh, Spark. So there's a lot of different ways to bring data in, but for Graph Studio, it's CSV or uh, S3 buckets. So what you're seeing here is you would, you would create, you would add a data file, and then you would add a mapping. Okay, so let me click on one of these and you can see what it looks like. So all you're doing here is you're saying, okay, what's the source? The source, you know, to populate the user, these two vertices, excuse me, these two, yeah, these two vertices, we're gonna populate this one with this identifier and this one with this identifier from the file. But as I mentioned before, 
edges are also first class um, things in, in a graph database. And so you can populate those with data as well. And so here's what that would look like. And what I've done here is we've created a, a simple uh, transformation uh, using one of our, what's called, a, what's called a token operator. And you, you have a whole series of those, what's called a token function rather, concatenate, reverse, uh, convert to integer. So several of these. So again, we're not an ETL tool, but we do have some transformation. So some, some simple, some functions for simple transformations. Uh, to do things like concatenation. So what we're doing here is we're concatenating concatenating three attributes so that we can populate this account uh, um, identifier. Okay. So we're going to be executing a series of queries, and it gets gets rather tedious to populate those queries by going over here. So. Um, go ahead and leave, that's okay. So instead of having to copy and paste from a document and create queries that we're gonna be in, end up running, I'm using our PyTigerGraph uh, Python package to persist those queries into our environment. So what you would do is, I'm gonna give you a link to this, uh, what's called a Google Colab. This is all Python code and you can just click the play button on each of these. You're gonna install a couple of Python packages. You're gonna set up a connection to your TigerGraph instance. We're gonna do a quick connection test. And then you're going to, uh, let, me, let me go ahead and show this really quick. So I know I'm jumping around a lot and I apologize, but you need to create a token. So there's authors, you know, in the, in the worlds of, of security, there's authorization and authentication. Password is, is, is authentication. You are who you say you are. Authorization indicates that you're allowed to do certain things. And what, what we do is we use a token um, to, to assert authorization. So what I would do here, you're gonna create, let's yeah, I'll create a token called my secret or a secret called my secret rather. And then from here, we're gonna generate a token. So I'll click plus. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna generate this you know, inscrutable uh, uh, string of alphanumerics. You would copy that. And then you put that in uh, this line right here, get token. So you'd replace whatever is in your copy with that token that you just generated. And that's gonna allow you to execute uh, queries against your TigerGraph instance, okay? Under the covers, we're calling TigerGraph's API and the API, our REST API uh, needs a token uh, to assert that you're allowed to execute that function. So that's what that's all about. And then we have a couple of, you know, real simple queries here just to test that everything's okay. So what happens when you press play here is this is actually going to communicate with your Tiger Graph instance and create a query in that instance, okay? So what you would end up doing after you run all of these statements is you'll have a fully populated instance of tiger graph um, that looks like this, okay? And normally I would go through several queries here that would show you, okay, well, here's how, here's what one of our queries that implements the post acume looks like, okay? So what this query does is that it gets the um, number of, of transactions this person has participated in, okay? Here, what we're doing is, um, let's see, where is it? Uh, I'm not sure where it is right now, but we're also doing one where we're doing an average. Oh, actually, I think this is the average, sorry, yeah. So we're gonna compute the average and that's something that you have to do. And then I showed you that teacher example is post acute. But let's get to the, uh, the good stuff in the interest of time here. So what I'm gonna show you uh, really quickly is I'm gonna go over to explore the graph and we're gonna have a look at a user. Okay, and I'm going to pick just five vertices, five user vertices at random. Okay, and let me show you a little bit more on this person here. Uh, type and where you're pressing. So these all represent, these are randomly chosen uh, user vertices. And when I double click one of them, you're going to see it expand uh, to all of the um, 
uh, other you know vertices that they have edge connections to, such as pay it's going and these are going to match the data model you saw earlier. You know, payments, devices, etc. So here's a payment instrument. Here are transactions, and now by virtue of the definition of a transaction, I should be able to double click on this and see for this person all of the. Um, sorry, that's a little too small here. There we go. All of the. Uh, accounts and other, you know, their relationships to other vertices. Okay, so you can keep doing this ad nauseum. And each one of these is like a, what, what I referred to earlier as a hop. You know, you're, you're going, and you know, you're, it's so easy just to double click and, and keep exploring the graph, you know, walk the graph interactively. Um, <clears throat> let me go ahead and illustrate, goodness, time really went fast. So I'm gonna go ahead, there's more to do here, but I wanna I want show you the page rank algorithm and, uh, and the other algorithms that we were going to, um, run here. So let me run page rank. And there's really quite a bit here, but fundamentally you can see here we've got our select from and our post queue. Okay. And this is an implementation of page rank. And what it does is again, it measures the uh, authoritativeness of a vertex by virtue of its relationships, incoming and outgoing relationships. So I'm going to run this and let's see here. The vertex type is going to be Sorry, one second here. Okay. Bear with me here just for a second. Okay, so it can be user. And these are, you know, these are parameterized so that they can be used in a lot of different uh, contexts. And then we're going to say user refer user is going to be the edge that we're going to be um, populating. Oh, shoot. Okay. I think we can keep all the defaults here. And the result attribute is going to be page rank. We're going to be populating the page rank algorithm. Okay. Uh, no file path. Okay, we can click run here. So what this is going to do is it's going to compute the page rank score for all of these vertices. Okay. And I'm going to pick two at random, or I'm going to pick a couple at random here. Um, Nope, sorry, let's see here. I'm going to go to explore graph and I'm going to go ahead and hide all this stuff. And I'm going to pick, let's see, one high ranked and one low ranked. So let's first do this guy. Let's see if I can pull that one. That one and this one. I happen to know these off the top of my head from doing this before. So here's what we have. We have two users and you can see one of them has a lower page rank than the other. And I'm gonna see how these guys connect. So I'm going to connect them um, just on the user refer user relationship. And I'm gonna go look, click expand. And what we're gonna see here is, and I'm gonna turn some, some stuff off. So I, I'm gonna point out here that, I, remember this one has a higher page rank than this one. We're gonna look, look why. Okay, we're gonna, I'm gonna make this a little less busy. I'm gonna turn off pretty much everything here so we can just see what we're looking at. And the reason why this one is more highly ranked is because he's got, or she's got three incoming edges and one outgoing, whereas this one only has, excuse me, this one has four incoming edges and one outgoing, whereas this one only has three. And then we can continue to do this. Let me go ahead and turn uh, those, that display back on and we can continue to do this and say, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and maybe just for this person and this person, I'm gonna to go to expand from there. And then you can see, oh, okay, well, why in turn were those uh, edges more authoritative? Well, they were more authoritative because, or this guy's more authoritative because um, of these other relationships. And you can keep doing this. So I can click this and say expand again. So you can see sort of the, I guess this one doesn't have any, but you can see the recursive nature of page rank by continuing to expand. Okay, we don't have anything there, but uh, uh, we've got a bit, yeah, so let me go ahead and clean this up in a second. So you can see here that, uh, you know, uh, for instance, okay, yeah, let's do this one. Let's do one more here, okay, expand. So why is this one 0.84, whereas this one's only 0.68, okay? And you can keep doing this. You see the recursive relationship of page rank, okay? So that is a whirlwind tour of page rank. What we're gonna do now is go over to Jacquard 
And um, boy, I'm really sorry. We're, we're going to go a little long here. I apologize. Um, but let me go over to, sorry, kind of hopping around here. Let me go over to page, or excuse me, um, to Jacquard and show that next. And I'm going to, so here we, again, we have the intersection over the union and that's, that's really essentially done right here. Now I know it's kind of hard to see, but what you're doing is the intersection size are divided by the union size. Okay. So that's what's occurs further down in the code. All right. And I'll go ahead and run this. And there's really just a few uh, parameters on this one that we need. And that is, let's see here. I'm going to go do top 10. That really should be it. Uh, click Y. And it's going to take a sec. All right. So let's go back over to Explore Graph. We can actually use these, these same users, but we can say, instead of joining on the user referred user, let's join on user similar to. So now I'm gonna expand here. And you can see that, well, we also have relationships here about users that are similar to each other. Okay, so using our uh, card similarity, we created this edge that these two users are similar to each other. And, <clears throat> this is going to get rather busy, but what I could do is, you know, so we did Jacquard similarity based on the, num the number of devices and transactions they have in common. So what I should be able to do is I should be able to click on, let's see, this one and have a look at the devices. So I'm going to click user device and user to payment here and have a look at uh, the devices and the payment instruments and expand from there for these, let's see, these two vertices. And I should see that they have some things in common and they do. Here they just have two, they have payment instruments in common. Okay, so that's essentially what Jacquard does is it finds similarity, at least this implementation of, for this use case, it's finding similarity based on shared devices. And we are over time, so I'm gonna really quickly just show one more uh, query and that's the, uh, this one's really kind of cool looking. It's the um, label propagation, which is community detection. So where did I put that guy? Um, oh, here it is label prop. All right. So I run this. And this is just a really quick one parameter. How many, remember I, I mentioned that it'll stop when either it's, it's uh, every, uh, all communities have been labeled, or if you reach the, uh, a certain number of iterations. So let me go ahead and hide this and run this. And this should just take a second. And these, the, uh, the basis for the uh, community detection is the similarity score. Okay, so let's see what we got here. You know, it wouldn't be a demo without some kind of shoot. I'm sorry. What this would normally show is seven highly connected components. We have a, I'm only showing a handful of the uh, communities here. So if anything is bigger than seven, I will show the communities here. And what that is, what, the, what that would show are these really tightly connected components, simply illustrating, uh, illustrating the, uh, the label propagation uh, method of creating communities. So I'm sorry about that. We went over time a few minutes. I, I hope you can stay on for a sec so I can get to your questions. Uh, but that was the whirlwind tour of Tiger Graph and Graph Analytics. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and open the floor to your questions. And I apologize we went over time. Are there any questions I can answer? Can everyone hear me still? Yes, we can. Okay. All right. Well, um, thank you so much. I'm I'm sorry that it was rushed, but we did cover you know everything I wanted to cover, if if not a little quickly. And then again, all these materials are available to you, and uh, um, I'm happy to follow up with. Um, yeah. So there is a JDBC uh, uh, 
Abdus asked, uh, Sadiq asked if there's a Java driver. And if um, I understand the question, is there a JDBC driver or, or a way to connect uh, to Tiger Graph via uh, Java? And yes, there is a JDBC driver that actually allows you to connect through. It's what we use for Spark as well. Um, if that's not the uh, question, um, please pipe, pipe in and, and um, I'll try to clarify. While we're waiting, Jeff, did you uh, kind of give a preview of the next session? And, and the, that's going to be on a Thursday, right? Yeah, I actually won't be conducting that session. Um, Kaylee, do you happen to know what the next session section is going to, excuse me, session is going to cover? Yeah, so it's going to be on supply chain. So I can share the meeting invite for you here. We're going to kind of go through again a, a little brief overview of what Tiger Graph is, and then show you how it's used for supply chain. So let me pull up the description for you. And, and yeah, all of these we're gonna send out in a recording. Um, we have a lot of content um, that you can see for how to set it up if you have questions, um, kind of what next to do. Our community is really um, helpful in uh, answering questions. So what we can do too is we'll include that in the follow-up email, how you can get in contact with the community. So here's the description for the next one. Um, it's gonna be a Tigergraph's introduction to graphic application, specialized session supply chains. So again, we're just gonna go through an overview of how you do it. We're gonna give a real life example um, for how uh, Tigergraph helped Jaguar Land Rover reduce their supply chain from three weeks to 45 minutes and saved 150 million. So, that's going to be the next one. And again, if you have any questions, um, email me. You have my email address, and then I can forward it on to Jeff, or we can ask the community. And um, we're really excited that you're all here. Thank you again so much. And uh, we look forward to hopefully seeing you at the next event. Well, thank you, Kaylee and Jeff. And I believe this next one is scheduled for next Thursday at 3 p.m. Central Time, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Yes, that is yeah, correct. Yeah. So uh, yeah, for scheduling reasons, we had uh, to change them. But uh, anyway, uh, thanks again. Really appreciate uh, your help with, uh, with our program here and look forward to the next session. Thank you. Thank Pleasure. you all. Have a Take great care, rest everyone. of your day. Thanks again.